How do cars and other devices connect a service to be able to show us things like the present weather? Well, let's go find out in this episode of Engineering the Jigsaw, what is a web interface? I'm Ian Cunningham from Vector GB. Let's go and have a look at what we're going to look at today. Well, in this episode, we're going to explore how things, including vehicles, are becoming linked to one another, data centers and the internet. This, and, and there's no prerequisite knowledge for this episode. This is a foundation level episode. Well, well what's the internet? Let's just start with the real basics. So often, of course, we associate the internet with email with social media, streaming services, hi, or websites. Now, actually those are just things that the internet enables. So when we're using those things, we're using software called a client, such as a mobile app or a web browser to request data from software on a remote computer or a server. So we make our requests and the data comes back and it is the internet that can, is the network that connects our client to the server so it can request the data that we want. Ooh, kittens. Or my next door neighbor's breakfast, depending on the website I'm looking at. What's actually happening in the background though? Well, nearly always, Clients are requesting data from servers using the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP for short. This was invented at CERN in Switzerland in the late 1980s, so actually quite a long time ago, by a gentleman called Tim Berners-Lee, now Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And as the name suggests, the data in these requests and the responses is nearly always text-based. But of course, if it's text-based, that means it can be read by someone who's snooping. So to prevent snooping, it's extremely common for HTTP requests and responses to be encrypted. And we do this using a technology called Transport Layer Security, or TLS, and the result is HTTP Secure, or HTTPS. And this prevents the evil hackers getting our banking details, or looking at our pictures of kittens and next door neighbors' breakfasts. Let's go have a look at some requests and responses to see what we can find. So here we are, and I'm going to use some special software to look at the data that's being transferred by a website to a, a, a client from the server of a website. So to start, I thought it might be interesting to look at the very first web page where HTTP and, and other really important concepts for the internet were first, first used. So. There's this website at CERN. This is the first website developed by Tim Berners-Lee way, way back at the, at the, like the birth of the World Wide Web. So the internet already existed. The World Wide Web is just something we do using it. And we can see that this is using HTTP. Uh, so it's not HTTPS. This is, this is a, a much older website. It, it's from before the time where HTTPS was a, was a thing. Now, if I make the request, if I send my request, I get this kind of view of, of the data that's being transferred. So I have this timeline that I can view and I can see the request. I can also see information about the response. Now, if I look in there a bit more closely, I can see that the tech, the content is text. So just like we said, the, the content is, is text and that actually there's about 2.2 kilobytes of, of data was transferred as, as a result of my request. Now, this is fine, but what does it actually look like? Well, let's look at the data that was transferred. So here it is the content, that 2.2 kilobytes of, of data that was transferred. Now, 
In here, we can see up at the, at the top here, there's this line that says, well, it's got a, a mark that says H1, and this means it's a heading in its HTML hypertext markup language. World Wide Web. The World Wide Web, open brackets, W3, is a wide area, and, and then it continues. So I can, I can kind of see the code, but let's just change the view using this software to actually see how it looks in a web browser. Well, look. There's the heading, World Wide Web, and the text just beneath it, the World Wide Web W3 is a wide area, blah, blah, blah. Here is the first website. So this is if way, way back in the, the late 80s, early, early 90s, this is how the, the web looked. Of course, things have moved on. So if we go to look at, for example, the vector website, so now we see the the website address for the vector website, we can notice straight away this is using HTTPS, so it's secured. And if I send the request and I look at the summary data, I can see still the content type is text, HTML. So the, the actual kind of content has not fundamentally altered in terms of what sits underneath it. Of course, What's being returned by the server is much more complex than that first simple website that we, we saw. And of course, if we change this over to the, the web browser view, we see the vector website as we expect to see it. Uh, well, as I see it, at least, because I'm in the United Kingdom. So when I, I browse it, I, I see it with this presentation. You're, you may see a different presentation in the country you're in. So. That's a, a, a quick look at how we can use HTTP to, and HTTPS to send a request, get data back, and then some client software can show us that data in, in a quite a pretty way, potentially. Okay, so that's great when it's a human being using the, the client to, to view data, but what about if we want to use that data in software, if we want to, to have some software that's going to do something based on that information that we're retrieving from the server. Well, if we think about modern software as is used in desktop PCs, laptops, mobile apps, or even high performance computing platforms in vehicles, then the data it works with may well, in fact, almost certainly is object oriented as we described in episode F8, what is a high performance computing platform. Now, together with HTTP based requests and responses, there's a technology called JavaScript Object Notation, Notation or JSON for short. And this allows a text based transfer of object descriptions for use in software. And it's not a, only able to be used in software, it's actually also human readable. So you or I could go and look at a response from a server that returns JSON, and we would be able to read it ourselves. It's not kind of like all ones and zeros, which are impenetrable to a, a human being. We actually see meaningful content as a human being as well. And if requests to the server always contain all the data that a server needs to respond, then we may, may be able to say that we have something called representational state transfer via an application programming interface or a REST API for sure. Now, represent, representational state transfer is not only slightly difficult to say, it's, it's re relatively complex words to say that we just have everything in the request for what we want the server to do. So the server doesn't need to remember anything we've done in the past, because if there's any information needed by the server, it will always be in the request. We don't make any assumption on the about the server needing to remember stuff that we've just done or done five years ago. And the reason for this is, of course, connections can become interrupted. So the server, if it was having to remember stuff, for every single client that connected to it might be trying to maintain some kind of state data. So what somebody had done previously for connections that have, are not going to be reinitiated, maybe somebody's turned off their laptop or the mobile phone battery has died. And of course, 
in this situation, we don't want to clutter up the, the memory in our, our server with all the information. We want each individual request to have all the information that we need. And this is a, a characteristic of a REST API. Let's go and have a look now at the kind of data we'd get from a REST API. So when we want to work with, with structured data for use in software, of course, we, we still want to use an HTTP request, probably a, a secured one, so we have encrypted data, and that's what we, we have here. So here I have the details of a, a weather server, and the Vector GB office is located in Birmingham in, in England. So I'm going to ask this server for the weather in Birmingham right now. So I send my request and now my content type isn't text HTML, it is application JSON. So we talked about JSON, JavaScript object notation. So here's the response from the server saying that what it's going to send us is not clean, pure text, it's JSON. And if we look at it, then we can see the actual JSON that's being transferred. Now, of course, there's no kind of pretty view of this because it, it's just data for use by something else. So we haven't got an app that's sitting on top of this that's going to consume it and maybe put some cloudy icons in and temperature indications. But all that information is here. So at the top, we can see a summary of the weather. So it's cloudy, well, broken clouds at least. And then the details. We've got temperature, what it feels like, the minimum temperature, maximum temperature, how much visibility there is, what the wind speed is, uh, the actual percentage cloud cover, and, and so on. So in this JSON, we have a lot of information that we could use in software to create a weather app to display weather information, for example, on a car infotainment system. So that was really interesting. Now, Hopefully you've been able to follow along and, and have a look at that data that's coming back from the from the, the web interfaces we've looked at, both the human readable and the, the machine readable, the software orientated web interfaces. And in this episode, we've looked at those technologies that can be used to provide a web interface. So we've looked at how we can use basic HTTP that we know from the World Wide Web as a means of transmitting requests and responses. And by using HTTP secured or HTTPS, we can of course improve security to prevent snooping on data. JSON then, the JavaScript object notation, allows an object oriented data transfer that is both compact and also easy to process, whether it is reading it or creating it at the client and the server. And actually, as we saw, also as a human being, we can look at JSON and we can kind of work out what's going on. And REST APIs, which we can build using these technologies, mean that servers don't need to store any data to process sequential requests from any individual client. Each request is complete by itself. This means that we can service lots of requests from lots of clients all at once because we don't have to remember anything that's happened in the past. Together, these technologies allow software, including in vehicles, to request data or provide data over the internet. Now, if you want to find some further information on, on web interfaces, well, you can visit our website to find out more about our digital engineering platform, Prevision, and of course, how it may be used to describe interactions between clients and servers in vehicles and beyond, because the, the, the client or the server could be in infrastructure, in a data center, maybe in another vehicle, so we can share data between vehicles as, as well. That's all possible. Also, look out for how Prevision itself provides an optional web interface to allow the use of custom clients to access engineering data. So this is a quite interesting possibility. And there are also standardized web interfaces for use in relation to vehicles. And for these, the following standards are especially relevant. So firstly, there's ISO 200781 parts one, two, and three, which is about the extended vehicle or XV web services. This was revised very recently in, in 2021. So it's, it's um, bang up to date and it, it talks about 
web services, web interfaces based on JSON, based on HTTPS that are suitable for use in, in vehicles to, to access data from vehicles. Also, there's a new standard in work right now due to be published very soon and which we already have information on the Vector website for in relation to Service Orientated Vehicle Diagnostics or SOVD. This is, as I said, it's being worked on right now. It's being finished off. It will be published by ASAM in 2022, so this year. So very shortly, really exciting time for, for diagnostics and new standardization there. Watch out as well for our upcoming episode on SOVD. That's everything we've got time for today. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Of course, as always, if you have any questions, any ideas that you, for topics that you'd like us to cover in future episodes, then please let us know. Please write us an email using our special email address, engineering.jigsaw at vector.com. Please drop a comment where you've seen this video in our YouTube channel, maybe shared on a social networking site via a web interface if you're using an app to access that site. Um, always, of course, hit the bell if you're watching on that streaming service uh, so that you get the notification to your mobile device where you can watch our new videos. I'm in Cunningham from Vector GB. See you again for another episode soon. Bye.